Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Rowena Itron, COO, and with me as always is Tim and I, Vice President of Marketing and Communications. Our podcast this week is with Lance Izumi, PRI Senior Director of Education. Lance's latest book is The Great Classroom Collapse. As we all know, academic performance of America's school children are at record lows. In The Great Classroom Collapse, Lance investigates why this has been the case over the last several years, and he profiles the many courageous people who are fighting for change. He tells the stories of parents, students, teachers, and policymakers who are succeeding in improving student education in their schools. The Great Classroom Collapse can be purchased on Amazon.com and other online bookstores. Thanks for listening, and here's Lance Izumi. Join PRI on Saturday, September 21st at the Four Seasons Hotel Silicon Valley in East Palo Alto for our annual Sir Anthony Fisher Dinner, featuring this year's keynote speaker and Toby Family Freedom Prize recipient, Kimberly Strassel. You read her Potomac Watch column every week in the Wall Street Journal. You see her on TV in her regular appearances on Fox News Channel. And you read her best-selling books like The Biden Malaise, Now, come see her in person at a terrific evening supporting PRI. She'll discuss the 2024 election, what's going on in our nation's capital today, and the fundamental importance of civil liberties. Visit pacificresearch.org slash events today to buy your tickets. While you're there, you can learn about sponsorship opportunities. We hope to see you on Saturday, September 21st. Tickets are selling fast, so visit pacificresearch.org slash events today to secure your spot. Welcome to PRI's Next Round Podcast, Lance. Well, thanks a lot, Ro. Great to be on here with you and Tim. So your last book was The Great Parent Revolt, and this book is called The Great Classroom Collapse. So tell us why this time you decided to focus directly on the classroom. Well, Ro, I think it's tremendously important for us to figure out what's really causing the nosedive we're seeing in student achievement. Now, we have national test scores that have fallen to their lowest level in decades, Seven out of 10 eighth graders fail to score at the proficient level in reading and in mathematics. So it's easy to blame the COVID pandemic, for instance, or the school shutdowns for the poor performance, but test scores were low before the pandemic. So there's something much more fundamental that's going wrong in our schools. I want to find out what those fundamental failings were, which is why I researched and wrote The Great Classroom Collapse. I I wanted to uh, dig down into why our children can't read or do math And so therefore, I dug down to the classroom level. I interviewed students and parents, K-12 teachers and tutors. I also interviewed a college math instructor and a state legislator who's a former teacher and who's trying to pass legislation to improve classroom instruction. Now, through these interviews, I was able to get a ground level view of what is really causing students to flounder. These problems range from replacing the pursuit of excellence with non-merit-based ideological practices to bad standards and poor curricula to teaching methods that have little or no research evidence to back them up. Now, another reason why I decided to focus on these individual interviews is because I wanted to tell the stories of the people who are living through this decline in our schools. These stories flush out what's really happening to our children, more so than just a bunch of statistics. That's why each chapter in my book is the story of one of these people who throws light onto a particular aspect of the disaster that is engulfing American education. Their stories make this book both interesting and compelling. So Lance, you open the book with perhaps the most controversial issue in schools today. And that's his concept of, quote, equity and the collapse of merit and rigorous teaching in the classroom. So talk about this concept of equity and why it's contributing to the poor performance of students. Yeah, thanks, Tim. It's important for people to understand that there's a big difference between the concept of equality on the one hand and the concept of equity. Equality means that everyone has an equal opportunity to perform and excel based on their own hard work and effort. In contrast, equity seeks the same result for all students, regardless of student merit and effort. So equity, as it's used in schools nowadays, is really a Marxist uh, concept that promotes mindless sameness. Concepts like excellence and individual achievement are viewed as suspect because they supposedly result from the privilege of the student, not from the talent and hard work of the student. That's why schools often close off pathways to excellence and instead bring down all students to a lower common level. So for example, in my book, I discuss how the Common Core National Math Standards 
which many states use, pushes algebra from the eighth grade to the ninth grade, even though many students are capable of handling algebra in the eighth grade. Why are the schools doing this? The answer is because schools don't want some students to excel and achieve. If that means other students are supposedly left behind, their solution is to force all students into a lowest common denominator situation. The San Francisco School District, for instance, even admitted that they had a social justice agenda to eliminate eighth grade algebra and force all students into ninth grade algebra instead. Lance, in, in your book, you interview a young woman who had a, a front row seat at what was happening inside the classroom when equity is embraced by schools. So tell us about that. Yeah, well, I, I interviewed a young woman who I called Charlotte for the book. That's not her real name because she requested anonymity. Now, she attends a public high school that used to be highly regarded and that had used an entrance exam for admission. But the school district decided that a merit-based admission system did not support equity, so the district changed to a random lottery system. Charlotte told me that this change caused a disastrous domino effect on academic rigor in the school. She told me that because the students admitted to the school under the lottery system had a lower level of academic preparedness, teachers became more lenient. For instance, deadlines became fuzzier with teachers adding grace periods for turning in assignments. For tests, teachers offered more and more retakes. So if a student didn't do well on a test, he or she could just take it again. Also, instead of grading based upon scoring levels such as 90% correct equals an A, there was more curving of test scores in order to give lower performing students higher grades. So these grading practices are often labeled equity grading. I just wrote an article on equity grading for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. The problem with equity grading is that it promotes grade inflation, reduces the incentive for students to work hard, and ends up actually hurting student learning. In Charlotte's school, she said that because the students were less prepared, her chemistry teacher didn't cover as much materials as he would have in past years. Also, she said that class participation was very low because students were not motivated. Charlotte said that she was held back in her learning because her classes just spent more and more time going over problems and materials that were already covered rather than going on to new content. In mathematics, algebra was pushed from the eighth grade to the ninth grade. Charlotte told me they just wanted everyone to be on the same level. But the issue is that when you put everyone on the same level, you're restricting those who have the potential to go ahead. So in her English classes, she said, nobody enjoys it. And there's a lot of unnecessary work, like sometimes even baking. And a lot of the hard, uh, work is not even actually analyzing, writing, and learning vocabulary. In her history class, she said that because the students didn't have good reading and writing skills, the class actually turned into an English class to make up for student deficiency. So it's no surprise that Charlotte now says that the school has a record student failure rate. So all these bad results stem from the equity agenda to which this school just mindlessly pushes. School officials they, they can see the failure that's going on. But the ideological commitment of these officials to equity is more important to the adults in the system than the learning of the children. So, Lance, you also look at equity from the perspective of a parent whose children's education were being undermined by it. Could you discuss her story? Yeah. So, Tim, I interviewed a Minnesota mom named Oradola Taylor. Uh, she grew up in the country of Sierra Leone, which is on the west coast of Africa. And she put her kids in a public school called the French Immersion School. School. Uh, the school was run by a Nigerian American, and many of the teachers and students were immigrants or from immigrant families. And she told me that the school was high performing, and it was actually one of the stars of the school district. And you would think that having a school that was doing so well with at-risk children would cause the district to want to replicate and scale up the French immersion model. But just the opposite happened. The district started to get rid of the curricula and programs that made the French immersion school so successful. So for example, because the district got rid of the proven traditional math curriculum, Oradola had to send her kids to an after-school math program. She also had to hire a tutor. She told me that the district was assaulting the school because all of the things that made the school successful were being taken away. Grading. It became more lenient, and the district pushed lax discipline policies in the name of anti-racism and equity. Oradola said that because of these changes, things just really start to fall apart. And she told me about an incident where a student threatened another student with a knife, and the perpetrator was back in class the next day. The parents at the schools protested all these changes to the school district, but the district officials, they didn't care. Oradola said that the officials told the parents that the school was privileged, uh, that the families and the students were too privileged. 
and that they needed to be like everybody else. But remember, many of the families in the school were immigrants from poor countries. But this adherence to Marxist ideology was more important than student achievement results. In, in fact, because the uh, French Immersion School succeeded actually in raising the achievement of minority and immigrant students, it actually gave lie to the diversity, equity, and inclusion narrative that systemic racism is the reason for poor performance amongst historically underserved children. So Ordola said that the district had to destroy the school because it undercut the progressive narrative on the achievement gap. She told me, if you have a school where poor immigrant kids are achieving, it was too inconvenient for the progressive district officials, so they targeted that school and made sure to run it into the ground. And Ordola told me that she saw firsthand how ideology and self-interest trumped the needs of children. Her conclusion, and I thought this was an interesting thing she told me, her conclusion was that the school system is actually a huge money laundering operation. She said there are kids out there who can't read, but everybody gets their cut, the unions, the administrators. It's a crazy money laundering operation, and the taxpayers are the ones who are paying through the nose for these kinds of results. And she says that the ultimate insult, at least according to her, is that the schools have the nerve to say, let's keep on doing this and then blame racism. So she told me that the incentives in public education are just all wrong. If you get more money because of failure, then you'll get more failure. Schools will then say, I need more money to do the same or worse. And that's the way the system works right now. She says that it's not complicated to fix how about how to fix uh, America's failing schools. What you need to do is change the incentives. She wants to actually empower parents with choice options in education, which is things that uh, Pacific Research Institute has been uh, supportive and myself in particular over many years and force the public schools to compete and meet the demands of their consumers. She told me, give me the money. I'm paying for my kid to go somewhere else other than the public school and that competition will fix the public school system in no time. Uh, she ended up telling me that she sees the impact of failed public education all around her. She says, I, I have friends who have businesses and they complain all the time that they can't find competent people. Now, Ordola Taylor should be living the American dream. Here she comes from Sierra Leone, a poor impoverished country in Africa, and she should be living that American dream. But unfortunately, she and her kids have had to live through the American Education Night. So let's 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 focus on reading. So we see all these stats about how poorly students are reading. And after I'm reading your book, I was astounded at how kids are learning how to read these days. They're actually being taught to guess the words. So many students are no longer actually being taught to sound out the letters and, and the words the way we were taught when we were kids. So tell us about the current method in teaching reading and how it's resulted in so many young adults now being poorly prepared for the work world. Yeah, you know, Ro, it would be a laughable situation if it weren't just so serious. So if you if you look at decades of research on how best to teach reading, the evidence is very clear. The National Reading Panel, which reviewed more than 100,000 studies on reading, found that the best way to teach reading is to use the so-called science of reading that emphasizes phonemic awareness and phonics instruction, which uh, means linking sounds to letters and then combining them uh, those sounds to form words. And it's exactly what you just said. Many of us learn to read this way because this is the sounding out method. Like I remember when I was growing up, my mother, who's an immigrant from Japan and who spoke broken English, uh, she used an old phonics vinyl record and flashcards to teach me how to read. And it worked. It's not rocket science. But despite all the evidence, once again, progressive ideology has come in to trump what really works. Like for decades, progressive educators have pushed something called balanced literacy, which has as one of its main tenets, the so-called three cueing method. Now under the three cueing approach, children who come to a word that they don't recognize are told to either guess what that word might be, look at a picture in the book to help them guess, or look at the first letter to help them guess what the word might be. In other words, uh, the three cueing method should actually be called the three guessing method. And the trouble is that balanced literacy with its dependence on this three cueing method just doesn't work. In fact, after years of schools adopting balanced literacy, Columbia University's teacher college, you know, very prestigious, uh, and which popularized this balanced literacy approach, ha has recently closed down its balanced literacy center because of the widespread criticism that the method just doesn't work. So unfortunately though, 
Many, many schools still use this ineffective and discredited teaching method, and kids are not receiving, you know, the type of instruction that you and I <laughs> received and were able to read the kind of instruction that my mother taught me. Uh, you know, they would have, kids would be better off going to learn how to read from my mom rather than a lot of schools. We'll get back to next round in just a moment. But first, are you getting PRI's regular email updates? If not, go to pacificresearch.org and click the sign up button at the top of the page to get the facts you need to fight back delivered every week to your inbox. Every week, PRI sends you what you need to know about what's going on in Washington, D.C. and Sacramento and gives you the free market ideas needed to save our state and our nation. By going to pacificresearch.org and clicking the sign up button, you can sign up to have Policy Alert, our weekly roundup of all the best ideas from PRI scholars delivered to your inbox. Or you can sign up for event updates so you're the first to know when PRI is coming to your community with great events. So sign up now at pacificresearch.org and click the sign up button at the top of the page to get PRI's content delivered to your inbox each week. One of the most heart-wrenching chapters of the book is the profile you write of the teacher who, at a moment of revelation, realized that she had been providing ineffective teaching instruction to her students for years. And she was actually never taught about phonics and other reading basics at the teacher college that she attended. So tell us about her, how she realized that the method she was taught wasn't working for her students and how she courageously came forth to try to turn things around in her own children's school. Oh, well, thanks for that question, Tim, because I, I do think that this is one of the most moving chapters in my book. Uh, and it's where I interview this woman named Missy Purcell, who is a mom and a former teacher in Georgia. Uh, she said that her teaching education program at the big state university she attended never taught her about phonemic awareness and phonics-based instruction. Instead, she was taught balanced literacy. She then gets a job as a teacher and proceeds to use balanced literacy to try and teach her students to read. Yeah, unfortunately, no surprise, it didn't work. She calls balanced literacy and the three cueing method limp through a book. So students would look at the first letter of the word, and as I mentioned earlier, they'd look at a picture and then try to figure out what the word was. She said that she had kids reading books with pictures, which was embarrassing since they're in the fifth grade. You know, she was teaching fifth grade at the time. And she said that she was supposed to teach students how to write a story or an essay. But because of the ineffective teaching method that she was using, many of her fifth graders couldn't read and couldn't write a complete sentence. She had kids reading at only a second grade level, but she felt compelled to give them an A because at least they could read a second grade book. And, you know, she actually told her principal, I don't feel like I'm being honest here. And not that I wanted to fail a kid because they weren't reading at grade level because it wasn't their fault. But I also didn't want to communicate to next year's teacher or their parents that they were reading on grade level because they had an A in the grade book, but they couldn't read a fifth grade book. And I, I think that really one of the most heart-wrenching parts of the book comes when I asked her about her students. And she initially got all emotional. And she said, I can tell you the names of kids just about every year that I taught that couldn't read. And I always wonder, where did they end up? And she actually found some of her uh, students on Facebook. And she said, there's this one girl who doesn't have a job and that's not making a lot of money. And she always wondered if she played a part in that. And she got all teary eyed and said, I didn't help her. She left fifth grade and went on to middle school and she couldn't read. And she also told me, I had a little boy who was French Canadian that had moved here and was in my fifth grade class. He just went to middle school and he couldn't write a complete sentence. She then said, I wonder what happened to him. I just wonder. I didn't have what I needed so I couldn't do what I needed to do. Well, Missy eventually left teaching to start her own family, but when one of her own sons had reading problems in the same school district in which she taught, she went on a crusade to find out what worked when it comes to reading and teaching reading. And she pushed for more effective reading instruction in the school. And she actually had to fight and fight the school district to get her son the phonics-based reading instruction that he needed. The district just wanted to give her son more of the same failed reading instruction. Uh, so she ended up actually getting a lawyer and filing a complaint against the school for failing to teach her child to read and using programs that were not evidence-based. The district ended up settling with Missy, and now her son gets that phonics-based reading instruction that he needs. And lo and behold, he's now a successful reader. She told me that 
uh, she he, that her son can now write an entire story, and he's working on a project researching the country of Colombia. And she said, "I can't believe it. It is just so amazing." And that's why she's become an advocate for better reading instruction. And again, she got emotional and told me that it's so incredibly wrong what we're doing the, uh, to the kids because people like a theory. She said that she doesn't care how adults in the classroom feel because it's robbing the kids. Lance, I got to tell you a story. So I was at a copy center a couple of weeks ago, and I was getting copies of PRI's board books. We had a, a board meeting, and I wanted six of them, and was weighing the cost of either getting black and white or color. And the young gal behind the counter told me that it was going to be ninety cents a page for color. I said, "Well, I've got fifty-six pages, so was it really going to cost me fifty dollars and forty cents a book? And that's three hundred dollars for six books." So I was shocked that it was going to cost so much. But But she was shocked that I could actually multiply that fast. Her poor head was spinning. So, Lance, this is this is not rocket science. In fact, it's it's elementary school multiplication. So, what's happening with our our math education these days? Well, I'd, I'd love to tell you, Ro, that your experience was an anomaly. It was an isolated instance. But I'm sure that、uh, you know most of our listeners have probably run into something similar, you know, in their everyday lives. So, one of the things that、uh, we've seen is that math test scores have gone down. Since the Common Core national math standards were implemented in most states in the early 2010s, there was an author of a federal study on the impact of Common Core who said that the negative effect of Common Core has increased over time. So, if you look at what is in Common Core, it's actually really shocking. Kind of go, and it goes to、uh, your story, Ro. Students are not encouraged to learn the multiplication table in the early grades. Instead, when they're multiplying, like, let's just take eight times three for example, students are asked to、uh, use their fingers to count threes until they get eight of them. They may even use physical prompts like head bobs to count by threes. Imagine all the extra time and work this method requires versus just committing math facts and operations to memory and being able to automatically recall them. No wonder that clerk at your copy place. Couldn't believe that you were able to multiply so fast. Think of all the head bobs she would have had to have needed to make that calculation. She would have gotten dizzy. So you know, think also too, like for example, about multiplying fractions such as one half times three fourths. I interviewed Mike Malioni. He's a math tutor and a former high school math teacher. In his school district, instead of just multiplying the numerators one times three and then the denominators. Two times four to get the right answer of three eighths. Teachers tell students to draw pictures instead. So Mike said that children were told to draw a rectangle and split the rectangle into parts, and then shade the parts to represent one half and three fourths. With the result that the shaded parts show three parts out of eight to make the whole. So the whole thing is tied to looking at a picture and counting instead of just multiplying. But imagine again. How time-consuming picture drawing is compared to just multiplying the numerators and the denominators. So Mike told me students are going to draw a picture every time they're given ten problems with、uh, fractional multiplication, when they could just do that in their heads. He said that's insane. He said that over the years. His opinion about math standards, curricula, and instruction has gone from well, this doesn't look too good to me, to I don't see how this is going to work, to oh my god. What have we done? This is crazy, Lance. Ma- as you mentioned, math is one of the fundamental subjects that's key to well-paying jobs, engineers, the sciences, even highly trained positions such as electricians and healthcare workers. So, what do poor math skills mean in terms of filling the highly technical jobs of the future that are critical in making the U.S. competitive? Well, Tim.、Uh- The future is not too bright. I can tell you that、uh, the collapse of academic rigor in the K-12 classrooms ends up having a huge impact in colleges and then employers. I interviewed a math instructor at a California college who teaches calculus. He said that the lack of foundational algebra knowledge is the number one deficiency, and it's chronic. He said that when a student comes to college without algebra skills and without analytical skills, there's really no hope. It causes a lot of problems because that person is not ready to be educated at the level of calculus. So because of they lack this necessary algebra knowledge and skills, he said that many students drop out of harder classes like calculus. Even amongst those who don't drop out, though, he says that a large percentage of them、uh, really aren't prepared either. He said that. If and I thought this was really interesting. He said that if his course was being taught in a high 
high performing country, uh, math performing country like Singapore, he predicted, I wouldn't be surprised if 80% of my students were not able to pass it at all. So here you have like really poorly prepared students for college who are then, if they leave college, are going to be poorly prepared for the work world. And he says that such poorly prepared students will have little chance in a highly demanding job market, such as, for example, Silicon Valley. He told me that you can see that companies don't want these graduates. There's a lot of competition for getting products that succeed, so you can't have a failing workforce trying to support your success. Jobs in high tech are really difficult, and when you're a software engineer, you really have to drive towards perfection because every mistake that you make will show up at some point and cost the company. So you're under a lot of stress to be perfect, he says. Unfortunately, if you have an education system that is not encouraging that and instead have a system that easily forgives mistakes, as you know, I've talked about earlier and which he pointed out uh, to me, students are going to collide with a totally different reality in high tech. Because that's not the way Silicon Valley works. They, they can't allow mistakes to pile up and they can't have people who have that kind of attitude, more important. So we're not producing the kinds of students and graduates that Silicon Valley needs. Instead, he told me the education system actually encourages and rewards the lack of rigor. And that is a horrible future that is staring America in the face. So the state of our students' education has now reached crisis proportions to the point that some lawmakers are, are starting to sit up and, and propose common sense legislation to return the focus from political ideology to the good old fashioned reading and writing. So talk about some of these proposals. Yeah, no, I think, you know, while there's a lot of, you know, tales of woe that uh, I mentioned in the book, there, you know, there is hope. And, uh, you know, in the book, I have a great interview with California State Assembly member Blanca Rubio. And uh, you know, she is a really interesting person because she's a Democrat, she's a former teacher, and she's an immigrant from Mexico. So earlier this year, she introduced a bill that would have integrated phonics-based reading instruction in the state's accreditation policies, the uh, teacher training, and curriculum. Uh, for years, California has favored, actually, the ineffective balanced literacy approach, which is why she introduced her bill. Uh, her bill gained the support, and this is really amazing, her bill gained the support of a wide spectrum of groups and individuals, from the California NAACP to the Republican leader of the state assembly. And she told me, let's put aside everything and let's focus on what the outcomes for our children are going to be. So when she was a teacher, she said she focused on using data to guide her instructional practices. She says that data is king when it comes to teaching. You know what's not king, she said, is hope and pray. That's not a strategy. She therefore introduced her bill because the overwhelming research data, as I've mentioned previously, supports phonics-based science of reading. Now, you know, it, it, all the evidence may point in one direction and uh, support her bill, but, you know, politics are a totally different thing. So unfortunately, her bill stalled in the legislature because the powerful California Teachers Association came out against it. The teachers union claimed that teachers in the classroom know best how to teach reading, but that flies in the face of the state's rock bottom reading scores. And it's obvious that many teachers do not know how to teach reading. So in fact, if you look at the National Council on Teacher Quality in a re recent report, they gave Ds and Fs to a large majority of the teacher training programs in California because they failed to teach prospective teachers how to use phonics-based reading instruction. And as I mentioned uh, in the chapter on Missy Purcell, I mean, she, she, and she went to uh, one of the best uh, schools of education in her state of Georgia, and she didn't get that training. That, this lack of proper training to teach uh, the teachers how best to teach students how to read is epidemic. It's all around the country. And that's why Blanca Rubio told me, we're not building cars. We are creating kids. We're creating lifelong learners. And we want kids to be able to learn and to be successful. Unfortunately, too often, she says that the kids are suffering from the political ideology of the adults. Now, thankfully, other states like New York, Georgia, and others are starting to move to policies that support uh, better reading instruction. So I'm therefore hopeful that things are slowly beginning to improve. Not fast enough, certainly not fast enough for the kids who are being failed by the public school system current, but at least uh, the Titanic seems to be, you know, uh, being turned at least uh, incrementally. But so the important thing here is that we continue to fight for what works. And that's really what my book, The Great Classroom Collapse, is all about. Thanks, Lance. It was very inspiring. 
Thanks again. Thank you, Ro. I appreciate it. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk about this book. I think uh, people will find that it's a really interesting book with really interesting stories that um, you know are going to ho- both hold their attention and you know uh, teach them and educate them, inform them uh, as to why we're facing the you know crisis that we're facing in American education. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.